Hello, everyone. Welcome to our uh, next TSVP seminar talk. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Anders Bjorn. From, he's a professor of Linköping University, Sweden, and he is an uh, expert on uh, potential theory, say. Um, potential theory is uh, one of the most fascinating fields of mathematics. It's originated from classical electrostatic potential theory, but it's now this field of mathematics in the intersection of partial differential equations from one side, probability theory, functional analysis, measure theory. And uh, uh, Professor uh, Byrne, in particular, expertise in, in abstract potential theory, which is he has a monograph joined with Jana Byrne, I think a nonlinear potential theory, which is one of the few monographs in this field. And he's talk about this, uh, the Dirichlet problem and the boundary regularity. And I would I have to just uh, one remark is that this is a uh, I think that uh, Wiener's Norbert Wiener's proof of criteria for the boundary regularity of harmonic functions is a starting point of the potential theory. So that's uh, is, a, is, a, is a great work which is was one of the most uh, I think prominent results in mathematics proving the criteria for boundary regularity of harmonic functions. And that's a starting point of the potential theory, I think. So, and so it's not incidental that the title of the talk today is related exactly to boundary regularity. Please. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, I also want to thank OIST and TSVP for the chance of being here. I've been here now for, we have been here now for a month and a half and it's been a great time all the time and I'm still looking forward to almost half a year more. So um, so I want to look at the Dirichlet problem and boundary regularity. I would maybe say that the potential theory even started earlier with people like Newton and Gauss and, and Dirichlet, which were way before Wiener, but it, it really took a different turn after Wiener's criterion, that's for sure. Uh, and a subtitle there, how to attain the boundary values in a good way. So let me start with looking at boundary value problems. So I'm sure you have all seen this. So if we have a differential operator, it, for this slide, it doesn't matter what it is. Later, I will mainly look at harmonic functions. Uh, then we can solve the operator here. I, for simplicity, I just took an interval on the real line. This is something, these type of problems are things that we maybe teach even first year undergraduate students to look at. So they solve an equation. They have only first or second order equations with constant coefficients. And then you can put boundary data, boundary values here. I have imposed the condition that the function should have some value at the boundary points, that's all the Dirichlet problem. In Down here, I have imposed instead condition on the derivatives, and then it's called the Neumann problem. And then of course we have, in this case, we have two boundary points, so we could have a mixed problem where we have a Dirichlet condition on one at one boundary point and a Neumann condition on the other. Uh, I'm not going to be interested in the Neumann problem, but this was just sort of, uh, explaining what are boundary value problems. I'm sure you have all seen this. Um, but I'm interested in the, in the Dirichlet problem. Um, now, when one studies these kind of questions for PDEs um, or, or general question, I mean, this was an ordinary, ordinary differential equation there, and these on this slide are as well. There are three fundamental questions. There is existence, uniqueness, and then what kind of regularity we can have of the solutions. And regularity could be continuity, C1, CK, then you can have Hölder continuity in between and so. If you don't, haven't seen these, you doesn't really matter that much, but C and C1 and CK, I'm sure you have all seen. Um, just to give an example, here I put up a problem where we have a solution. This is a Dirichlet problem. I have Dirichlet boundary data conditions here. 
Uh, and here, the, this is the unique solution. So we have uniqueness. Now, if I change the coefficient here to pi squared, then pi squared is an eigenvalue, actually, of this, this operator. And we will have more solutions. And then they all look like this. So in this case, we have non-unique. So that's sort of looks at that we can have these kind of problems with uniqueness or with non-uniqueness. Um, OK, those were just uh, appetizers in one dimension. I'm interested in higher dimensions, so two and higher dimensions, and later on in metric spaces. But let me start a bit slow and start with two dimensions, and then we have a domain. So this is a domain G, some open connected, um, and I will have a bounded domain for simplicity um, in the plane or in higher dimension. And I have a continuous function on the boundary. Uh, and then what I want to solve, and now I restrict myself to the Dirichlet problem here for the harmonic function, so for the Laplacian. So I want to solve the Laplacian equal to zero in the, in the domain. So that's the same thing as saying that U is harmonic in G. Uh, and I want to have U equal to F on the bound. Uh, here is just the expression for the Laplacians in two variables. And so what we, what do we really mean here? Well, we mean that the, the solution that we have inside takes these boundary values f of x as limits at all boundary points. So this is the boundary dg. And this is called Dirichlet data because we actually look at the value of the function, not that derivatives like we would do in, in the Neumann problem or so. So basically, we want the solution that is continuous up to the boundary. Um, so in this case, I said we had three sort of key questions, uniqueness and existence were two of them. Unique, uniqueness is not the problem in this case. If you have two solutions, they have to agree. So, um, but existence is, is not so clear. So Dirichlet from almost 200 years ago, uh, solved this problem by minimizing the energy. Um, so this is the energy of a function. You take the gradient of the function and square it and integrate. You can recall maybe, I didn't have much physics in high school, but I have had this formula uh, with a square, and this is sort of where the square comes from. Um, um, so he minimized this over all functions which are continuous up to the boundary. They take the given boundary data on the boundary, and they are C2 inside, so we can easily calculate this um, integral. And if you have a minimizer, then it turns out that it's harmonic. I mean, that was one of the observations he did, I guess. Um, and it then solves the Dirichlet problem because we have we have the right boundary data, um, and since the energy here this is an integral which can never be negative, the energy is always non-negative. It's clear that the the infimum of all these energies exists, but why is there a minimizer? Um, infimum here is the greatest lower bound, and you can compare it with if we take all the positive real numbers, then the infimum is zero, but there is no smallest positive real number. So there's no minimizer in that case. Of course, that's a very different problem. That's not our problem, but it still emphasizes that the infimum doesn't necessarily have to exist. Dirichlet missed this point. It was and uh, later pointed out around 1870, I think, by Weierstrass, that this was a, a weak point in Dirichlet's argument. Um, he had another problem where he showed that in that case, the minimizer did not exist, but it did not show that this 
one did not work. Um, but at least there was some sort of missing point in the argument. So then if you go to these days to, to Google, look at the Dirichlet principle, or you can get to Wikipedia. I got this page actually from Wolfram Mass World, which says something here, there are some things uh, here, there is a U missing, so one shouldn't completely trust everything that's written down. But here at the end, I put a, a square here, uh, or the square, a big rectangle rather. Uh, Knesser, however, obtained a valid proof of Dirichlet's pr principle. So when you read that, you think, okay, Nessie filled in the argument, everything is fine. Uh, if you read Wikipedia, you get the impression of the same thing, but there I think it was Hilbert that was quoted. I'm not exactly sure what Knesser and Hilbert did, um, but um, anyhow, you, so reading this, one thinks, okay, everything is fine, but then I wouldn't keep be giving this talk. So if G is smooth, um, what is smooth, it's for instance, locally a graph of a C1 function. And this one might be that. Well, here it's not even uh, connected, but still. Um, but what about the general case? Uh, the simplest example of, of a domain which is not, which does not have a C1 boundary is a square. We may very well want to solve the Dirichlet problem in a square and, and in many other situations. I mean, this is a classical problem that appears all over mathematics and, and applications. So, so here, okay, the square is uh, little special maybe in one way, but it's not covered by the, the smooth domain. Uh, another situation which is a bit more complicated is if we take a ball and remove a counter set, here I have a plan, Planner counter set. <clears throat> uh, and these are just examples. So we could have very complicated geometry. And there are many domains. Most domains are not do not have a smooth boundary. So then, uh, then there can be a problem. And to see what really can happen, we have these two key examples of what can go wrong. <clears throat> So let's look first at the, the top here. So here I have a G, which is a ball or a disc in, in two dimensions. And I have removed one point here. So it's what I call a punctured ball or punctured disc. This example is due to Zaremba from 1911, just four harmonic functions. So here is the G. Uh, I put zero as the boundary values on the, on the circle and one in the middle, that's a perfectly fine continuous function. Uh, but when one tried to solve this, the, the only natural solution is sort of missing the, the value in the middle. And the natural solution is constant zero everywhere. And it's greatly wrong at the, the center of the circle. And we say that zero is an irregular boundary point. Uh, I will be a bit more precise with the definition in a little while. So that may look like, okay, you have this isolated point. It's sure did these things go wrong there, but uh, but Lebesgue, the same guy as with the Lebesgue measure, came up with a different example in the next year. It's called the Lebesgue spine. Um, is this? Stopped working. Let's see, no, it works. Okay, <clears throat> so this this has to be done in R three. It should be a, an exponential cusp disappearing here. You can think a little bit like an apple, and that you have a stalk here. <clears throat> and then it turns out in this situation that the tip of the stalk here, its origin, is an irregular boundary point. Um, here, this one is not isolated, and one have to put in the appropriate boundary conditions, but one can put one over this whole cusp, and then somehow make the, the function continuous here, and 
go down to zero there and then one see this behavior. <clears throat> so these two examples show that we can have irregular boundary points. And then um, um, we, I guess maybe Lebeg or, or someone else realized that what one should do is one should first relax the problem, find somehow a solution, even though it does not quite fulfill the requirements we have, and then look at when does that solution fulfill the requirement. And Perron in 1923 came up with uh, a way of solving this. So he looked at, <clears throat> if I have my sort of boundary data here, he looked at uh, functions which are super solutions and somehow lie above these boundary data at all the boundary points. Here I have only two. Um, and then he, take, he took all these super solutions or super harmonic functions and he take the, took the infimum of them. So all of these super solutions should be larger than the expected solution. So the infimum of all those should also be larger or possibly equal to that. Uh, and that creates an upper Perron solution. Then one can do the same thing from below and have a lower Perron solution. And if those two agree, then that should be a good solution. Um, and then the question is, when do they agree? Uh, and for harmonic functions, I believe Wiener was the one who proved that a year later. He showed that for continuous functions, they do agree. Then one can also consider this problem now for non-continuous boundary data. Um, then we can never expect to have continuity at all the boundary points, but this still makes sense. So that makes this a more general method as well. And in that situation, it can happen that we have inequality between these two. And the major question is, when do you have equality? Then you have a good solution. If you don't, and then maybe it's still a reasonable solution, one or, or the other. Um, they are also many uses. But, but for continued boundary data, we now have a solution, then we drop the bars, and we call this, we denote this by PF. So we have this solution, and then we can look at when is the limit of PF the given f of x, not just for one function f, but for all um, continuous boundary data. <clears throat> then if that happens, then we say that x is regular, and otherwise it's irregular. And that's how one can really define the irregularity of the Saramba and the Lebesgue spine examples. <clears throat> and Wiener in 1924, uh, I guess he had a couple of papers in maybe 24 or 25 on this. Um, well, one is with this Wiener criterion, which says that a point or here I have put the point at zero, doesn't we have scale invariance in the space, so we can concentrate on looking at when the origin is regular. Um, so zero is regular if and only if uh, this condition holds. Uh, now here, he capacity is connected with uh, um, capacities in physics, but here it's really introduced as a set function. And he, it was Wiener who introduced it as a set function defined for every set. <clears throat> exactly how it's defined, I don't want to go into. That's um, a bit technical and, and not so important here. The important thing is maybe that we have a, an if and only if condition uh, this way. Um, and we can draw some conclusions of it. For instance, we can draw a conclusion that regularity is a local property of the boundary. If I have two domains that look the same around the point, but different far away, then in here, these terms will be exactly the same 
from some k onwards. And the, the first values don't matter because we're only summing finite numbers. Um, so this is a consequence of Binner's criterion. Then there are other consequences, of course. Uh, another thing that came a few years later is the Kellogg property, which says that the capacity of all the irregular points is zero. And at the same time, one should note that the capacity of the boundary of a, of a domain is positive. So we it can never be that sort of the, all of the boundary contains irregular boundary points. In capacitary sense, most boundary points are regular, but we can still have some irregular boundary points. And, and capacity is a finer way to measure size than, than volume or the big measure. Here I put down some uh, comparison in this case with the Hausdorff dimension, in case you have heard of that. Uh, also, capacity is not the measure according to measure theory, but Capacities are the, according to this criterion, it's the right way. We cannot measure this using measures. We need capacity, and capacity is also intimately connected with Sobolev spaces, which are important in various um, for PDEs and, and things like that. So, so they they are important for many different other reasons. For all what I've said here about harmonic functions, so this was now known, well, not the Kellogg property, but the Wiener criterion is 100 years old this year, right? <clears throat> um, these were for harmonic functions. Harmonic um, functions or the Laplace operator is a linear operator. If we take the sum of two harmonic functions, we get another harmonic function. And that's used extensively in, in these kind of, in, in these papers. Uh, but I'm interested in the nonlinear theory, which is the later development starting maybe around 19, the 1960s or so. So if you recall from earlier, I said that the harmonic functions are somehow local minimizers of um, this energy integral. If we replace the power two here by a power p, we get a nonlinear problem. And we can look at the minimizers for that. Um, these solutions or these minimizers are then called p harmonic functions. Mm -hmm. uh, and one can, so they are minimizers of, of this, or equivalently, they are solutions of the or corresponding Euler Lagrange equation, which look like this. <coughs> and I see them as a prototype for a large class of nonlinear elliptic equations. And that the main prototype for sort of a nonlinear generalization of harmonic functions. And here one can make it much more general. One can put in coefficients and weights in this equation and so, but this prototype works well enough for, for um, and much of the theory holds in that case as well, but, but let's keep it a bit simpler here. Uh, one point here is that regularity says that regularity theory uh, shows that p harmonic functions are continuous, uh, but in general, they are not C2, which is what you really would want here when you take the, the gradient and then you take the divergence of the gradient, you would need to have C2 Solution, so one have to understand this equation in a weak or distributional sense. That's also a 20th century concepts of how to solve equations that we have. We cannot just understand it in the, what we now call classical solutions. So for harmonic functions, any weak solution is actually C2 and even C infinity. But that doesn't hold here. So we have to understand the equation that way. But that's, uh, I have worked a lot with harmonic functions on metric spaces. So let me say something about what is a metric space. So a metric space, instead of just a plane or so, we have a set and we have a distance function. 
and a distance function should satisfy the following these three conditions here. So it's a function taking two variables um, from the space x. If we have the same point, then the distance is zero. Uh, the distance is symmetric, and it's if we have two different points, it's always positive and finite. And then we have the triangle inequality holding. Uh, some of you may have heard Jana's talk or Sylvester's talk, where they also talked about uh, metric spaces did here in, uh, in February. <clears throat> so in metric spaces, we have distances, but we don't have directions like we have in, in, um, <clears throat> in Rn. Uh, so it's difficult to talk about the gradient because there we take partial der derivatives in the different axial directions and then put them together to a vector. But we can still define something called an upper gradient. So if I have two points x and y and I look at the curve between them, <coughs> I want u of x minus u of y to be less or equal to the integral of g ds over the curve gamma. If this holds, and it holds for all curves um, and with different starting points, and I say that g is an upper gradient of u, and one can define a minimal upper gradient as well. Here I could make the upper gradient larger. It would still fulfill this. Uh, this is basically based on, on the formula um, u prime of x dx that we learned to use already in high school to calculate the integrals uh, using antiderivatives. Uh, but this then gives us an upper gradient and in metric spaces or in, in Rn, the upper gradient GU is nothing but the um, absolute value of the, the normal gradient. And when we minimize the energy, we were just looking at the absolute value of the gradient and then took the piece power of that and looked at the energy that way. So we can easily define this and look at minimizers this way. But because we don't have the, the gradient structure, we don't get to an Euler-Lagrange equation. So sometimes I'm saying that I'm, I'm working in PDEs, but without equations. Um, here, I have also put the mu here. So we have to, in the metric space, have some way to measure volume of, of sets as well. And then this is now measured by mu. Um, and this measure has to satisfy for, for our theory two conditions called doubling and Poincare inequality. I won't, don't want to go into what they, what they mean, but with those two conditions, then we can get a quite nice theory. And uh, these conditions have to be satisfied at least locally. So <clears throat> examples of phases where we satisfy these assumptions. So we can have, well, we can have Rn, we can have closed subsets of Rn, we can have Rn with weights, we can have manifolds, higher dimensional surfaces or two dimensional surfaces, of course. So all this falls into the theory. Some fractals we can have graphs, networks they're called in some applications you can have heisenberg groups and very irregular spaces <clears throat> so this is that the theory of harmonic functions and to some extent peer harmonic functions had been extended to some of these settings before but this is sort of unifying the whole giving one approach to covering all these cases and there are applications in porous materials and and again um, a motivation. This is a prototype for nonlinear elliptic equations. <clears throat> uh, more examples. 
with pictures. So here I have the von Koch snowflake curve, which should, here it should be, the, the curve is actually the boundary here. here. My space is everything inside, including the boundary, but, but I don't have the outside. Over here I have what's called the Sierpinski carpet. So first one, I take a, a square, I rem split it into nine smaller squares and I remove the middle one. Then from that one, from each of the eight remaining, I split that one here into 25 smaller ones and remove the middle one. And then if I do this in a certain way, depending on sort of how these factors are, then this, this will also fall within the, the scope of our theory. Uh, another example is to take this, which is the first and the third quadrant and join those into the space. Here they are just connected by one point and that cre creates interesting counterexamples in many situations of what can and cannot happen. <clears throat> and over here I have an example where you can have a one dimensional space glued to a two dimensional space and that can also be covered by the theory. Um, so. So these are just examples of what can be covered. And, and then some results that we have. <clears throat> so one result that we obtained about 20 years ago was that if we have a continuous function, then we actually, well, first of all, the PF here is the Perron solution again, and it means that the upper and lower Perron solutions agree. So one of the results, or parts of that theorem is really that the upper and lower Perron solutions agree in this situation. For Rn, this was known for p harmonic functions earlier. <clears throat> um, and then we have an invariance thing here as well. So f is a continuous function, and then I have a function h, which is zero, I say quasi everywhere here on the boundary. <clears throat> and that means that the capacity of the set where it's non-zero, the capacity of that set is zero. <clears throat> so I can have a few points on the boundary, but not the whole boundary where I change the value and I can change it arbitrarily on those. Um, and then, wonder if the battery is running out on this one. Oh, no, now it's working again. Um, then, the Perron solution does not see the values at those points, simply. At least not if f is continuous here. If you change f to non-continuous, then, then we don't have those kind of results in general. <clears throat> uh, and this invariance result was new also for unweighted Rn. Um, in the linear case where we work with harmonic functions, everything is much easier. We can just use linearity like this. And then you just look at this H as it is. <clears throat> and um, know that pH is zero and then that gives um, the solution. But, but in the nonlinear theory, that approach is not possible. <clears throat> More results that we obtained were the Kellogg property. I think really the battery is running out on this one. Uh, like we don't have any replacements, I guess. Might take a few minutes. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> sorry for that. Let me see if I can uh, point here instead. So the Kellogg property we have um, that the set of capacity zero points are. No, the, the irregular points have capacity zero. This time the capacity, I put the P there. The capacity now depends on P and also on, uh, on the measure and the, the metric space. Um, uh, as a consequence of uh, results we had, we also obtained that regularity is a local property of the boundary. But here we could not use the Vini criterion because we don't have that one 
in this in full generality. We have one direction, but not the other in metric spaces. In Rn, it's um, known. Um, uh, and then another result we obtained was this uniqueness result here. So if you have a continuous function, then uh, the Perron solution is the unique bounded p harmonic function, which takes the boundary values not everywhere, but quasi everywhere on the boundary. <laughs> and this was also a new result for, for unweighted RN. Uh, and these were 20 year old results, but un for unbounded domains, these turned out to be much more challenging. And, but last year we managed to obtain basically a full generalization of that one and a slight modification of the, <coughs> of the first CRM now also for unbounded domains. But that took us 20 years to achieve. Uh, okay, regular points now. If we are in Rn, then the Wiener criterion implied that smooth and even Lipschitz domains are regular. So in particular, the, the square that we had in the beginning, uh, a domain is regular if all the boundary points are regular. Uh, that's the nicest example. And even here, uh, if you have a domain with the snowflake, the snowflake domain, then uh, all the boundary points will also be regular in this situation. So, uh, and if P is greater than N, then the capacity of every point is positive. And by the Kellogg property, it turns out that there cannot be any <coughs> irregular boundary points, so all domains are regular. Okay, let's see. Okay. Um, so that's also nice that in that situation, we don't have need any condition at all. Uh, in metric spaces, oh, sorry, um, we don't have any way of defining smooth domains in general metric spaces. So, of course, we can still sort of use the Wiener criterion when we have it or so to, to deduce. But what kind of nice domains do we have in metric spaces? Well, we have balls at least. Balls we have in all metric spaces. But it turns out that they can, they can be irregular. <coughs> And it's actually not that difficult to find an example. So if my space, let's say this is my space, it's the first quadrant. And I take a ball with exactly this radius. So if this is one, one, and I have radius square root two, then this will be a boundary point. This bit here does not exist in the space. This bit here does not exist. So that this ball will go something up here. <coughs> um, and th this bit will be boundary as well. And this will be an isolated boundary point. And that one will be regular if and only if um, P is greater than two but it's irregular if P is less than two. So I have a ball with an irregular boundary point. Okay, this, with this center, it's just this radius that gives an irregular ball. But if we work in what's called the Heisenberg group for, for harmonic functions, so for P equal to two, we have harmonic functions over there. That's the linear case. and we. Have it. So for harmonic functions on the on the Heisenberg group, uh, it turns out that the south and north poles are irregular. So and that's for every ball. So no ball is regular. Um, so balls can be problematic, but but there are still regular domains. <clears throat> um, so if we go back a little again and look at 
at the punctured ball on the Lebesgue spine. Again, now in the punctured ball, the origin here is regular, if and only if the capacity of that point is positive, which if it's in Rn, happens if P is greater than N. But we could have a punctured ball like that in the metric space. <coughs> and then it depends on the metric space. And maybe it also depends on where the ball is placed. In metric spaces, you can have some points with positive capacity and others with zero capacity, <coughs> which can also happen in weighted aura. Um, then that's the regularity of this point. Then we could also have irregular points here on the boundary of here on the circle or on the boundary of the ball. Like if we take the Heisenberg, the, the ball in the Heisenberg. <clears throat> now this one, and, and here we have a different situation. And it turns out that <clears throat> I said that these are sort of two, two examples of irregular boundary points. And it turns out actually that the behavior at in these two examples are very different. And one can show that the if you have an irregular boundary point, its behavior is either of this type or of this type. I don't want to specify exactly what the types are, but, but one can classify the irregular boundary points in two ways, and they have <laughs> drastically different behavior. And that's also something one can do in this general theory for p harmonic functions on metric spaces. And um, I think for harmonic functions, that kind of classification uh, fully was done only in about 1980. But <clears throat> um, then I want to mention also that there, so I have so far the Perron solutions is a potential theoretic way of solving the Dirichlet problem. A PDE person would probably take a different approach to the Dirichlet problem. The Dirichlet problem appears. <coughs> um, we could do this in Rn or in the metric space, and we have a bounded domain. <coughs> and then we say that we have a function which lies in the Soblo space, whatever that is. But the PDE version, person would work with Soblo spaces quite a bit. And for such a function, there is a unique p harmonic function, which I denote h g, maybe h for harmonic, um, and g for the domain, such that this difference is in the zero Sobolev space, whatever that exactly means. But it gives a solution to the Dirichlet problem in quite a different way from the Perron solution. <clears throat> and one of the results we had, and actually this was one of not just the result, but it was also one of the tools that we used to obtain some of the results was um, that if you pick this Sobler function and the representative of it in a reasonable way, something called quasi-continuous, then actually the Perron solution and the Sobler solution agrees. <clears throat> For stated like this, I have not seen this result for harmonic functions in the literature before our paper. <coughs> uh, and we did it in the nonlinear theory. Uh, I think it's partly because PD people work with this type of solution. And then you have people working in linear potential theory. They don't even know what Sobolev spaces are. They have heard of them, but they stay away from them. So it's sort of different communes. But when you go to the non-linear potential theory, you need to use Sobler spaces all the time. So for us, it was natural to, to think in these terms. Uh, and we also had this kind of invariance result down here. <coughs> um, uh, let me end with another example showing some, some things of what, what is tricky in this setting. So there was a paper by Albert Bernstein, uh, an American mathematician, um, paper from 1998, where he looked at a very simple situation. You have a disk, 
and you have two open arcs on the disk, E1 and E2, on the boundary of the disk. <clears throat> you could have more arcs as well, but let, keeping it simple, we say two arcs. <clears throat> and the boundary of these two arcs, well, there are two boundary points here, two here and two here. So we have four bound. And now if we take H to be the characteristic or indicator function of those four points, uh, then we know from our invariance result that if we have a continuous function on the boundary and we add or change it on, on those four points, the Perron solutions will still be the same. Uh, well, strictly speaking, that holds if P is less or equal to two because this is now, this, this set has to have capacity zero, and that happens if P is less or equal to two. If P is greater than two, all points have positive capacity, and then we cannot use our invariant result. <clears throat> okay, but what if we take the characteristic function of, of these arcs? So we have these two arcs here. We take the boundary function that's one on the union of those two arcs and zero everywhere else. This one like makes jumps at the, the four, four points. <clears throat> and then the question is, do we get the same Perron solution for, for the union of the open arcs and for the closed arcs? And this was exactly what, what um, Al Bernstein was asking. Of course, for the linear case, you use linearity, then you just have to calculate the Perron solution for the characteristic function of those four points, and that one is, happens to be zero. So then, then it's sort of trivial, and no one would even think of, at least not write a paper about it. <clears throat> but for p less than two, or for p greater than two, this was not known. Well, for p less than two, it turned out that we could use our results. We have to figure out that this characteristic function here is actually a restriction of, a, of the Sobolev function in the plane. <clears throat> and then we could use our invariance results from 2003. So in 2006, we obtained that for p less than two. <clears throat> for p greater than two, that approach is not possible for two reasons. Well, one is that the, these four points now have positive capacity, so we don't have the invariance result. And the other one is that the, this uh, characteristic function is no longer a restriction of the Sobolev function. So both ingredients sort of fail drastically. <clears throat> but uh, I managed to find a different way of approaching this and managed to show that, yes, indeed, we have equality here also for p greater than two, and also that we have this, this thing is also holding for p greater than two, even though now these four points have positive capacity, but, but we still have invariance that way. Um, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Um, so thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the great talk. So, um, um, so uh, I'd like to uh, understand this. Um, so you have this P Laplace problem and you want to solve this Dirichlet problem. So, um, so how does this uh, um, regularity of the domain um, for us to solve this uh, um, PDE um, depend on the P, exponent P? So, um. Yes. Um, um, yes, when P is bigger than N, basically you can do it in a boundary, yeah. in a boundary data, but and it's P is less than N. For P less than N, um, not sure if this has been, um, written down anywhere, but if I remember, Remember correctly, you do have the monotonicity of of it. Um, 
if you are in a situation where you have the winner criteria. Jana, do you recall? Yeah, if from the winner criteria, it follows that for larger piece, it's easier to be regular. Uh, but I think there is not a proof, or at, I don't know of any proof that actually uses the regularity definition like that does not go through the winner criteria. Yeah. And it would be very interesting to have uh, yes. a direct proof of. Yeah. And I think that proof, I have not seen that anywhere in the literature, but we I have it written so, yeah. in some notes that are not found. Yeah. But in metric spaces where we don't have the Wiener criterion, we actually don't know. I mean, that's what you believe. Uh, uh, but, but we don't know. And it's kind of hard. Typically, you, you fix a P and then you do all the theory. How what is happening when you change the P is a kind of different matter. So and also I believe the question is about the case when P is bigger than N. So do you have like more precise continuity, like holder continuity or Lipschitz continuity? Um, yes. Um I mean, I just a general question. I mean, even you clean a case, I, I'm well, just going to swap with embedding. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah. Okay. I mean, the, this is related with the swap with embedding. But in other cases, with P, that's a critical question was P less than N. It took a long time to complete. But the important thing is the capacity, because I mean, overall, this is explained well. So, uh, regularity is about the point is decided by PD and geometry of the bound. They work together to create this regularity. So capacity depends on P, and that basically was how operator influences geometry. So that's basically what's what is. So P less than N. But P bigger than N, so our embedding just continues. Yeah. Okay. But depending on the size of the complement, you can get estimates for how fast the solution attains its boundary. That values. modus of continuity is yeah. yeah. yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah. exactly. This is an estimation basically in, in the case when it is irregular, then yes, he has a modus of estimation for the modulus of, of continuity, continuity. Also, how fast you attain those values. But other question, if you ask a question about even for the class, I mean, the question, then to find the criteria for held the continuity. Not just continue to hold the continuity. That's also the thing. Also, again, mm. operator and geometry, the work together. Yeah. Is there any other questions? Feel free. Good question. You confirm, like, when you say that in a Heisenberg group, the North Pole and the South Pole, like, like an irregular point, you mean a CC pole, right? Uh, it's a ball generated by a kind of ordinary uh, magic, not the gauge ball. So it's the ball is looking like an apple shape. Yeah, it's sort of. Yeah, okay. That, okay. That's, okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm not an expert on the Heisenberg group, but we found this result somewhere in the uh, quoted it. So, uh, Good. Other questions? Okay, so in, in uh, metric metric spaces, how far you go with uh, boundary functions? So beyond, the, can you is it Perron solution when you have a, like Borel measurable bounded Borel measurable functions? So it's more than. I mean, you can define the Perron solutions for for arbitrary um, boundary data, right? I mean, no, no, do no. you take just? Yes, I mean, the no, upper and lower Perron solutions. But, but but when they match, it's a question. Basically, I would say that um, so th th this, this result here, um, that if you have, now, if this is the Sobland space in the metric setting, uh, maybe one don't have to, you don't really have to impose the, that it's in the global Sobland space, but a local Sobland space, and you take a Quasi continuous representative. And uh, I mean, from this result, this one says that upper and lower Perron solutions agree. And that covers sort of basically, well, more or less all the cases we know when they agree. Also on RN, um, there are 
some more results around here where I obtained also some, some results where we have uh, that they agree, but, but basically on our end and, and um, in metric spaces, it's the same thing. I mean, you have this and then you can also use that together with uniform convergence. If you have a sequence of functions that converge uniformly and all of them are resoluted and the limit function will also best be resoluted. So from this result, you can get to all the continuous functions because they can be approximated uniformly by Lipschitz functions, which lie in the subload space. Uh, and that's actually how we prove the resolutivity for continuous functions. But that's basic, basically mm -hmm. beyond that, we don't really know. On to... the regular domains, you can also take arbitrary semi-continuous functions. Uh, that's true. We yeah, we have some results about sem semi-continuous functions and bounded semi-continuous functions on regular domains are um, also resoluted. So that was I should have actually said that here when we looked at this Perron solution. So this is a lower semi-continuous function. We knew already from uh, from the book by Heinon and Kipplin and Marty from '93 where they have this or maybe even before that, that the upper and lower Perron solutions agree here. And also this one is an upper semi-continuous function. We knew that upper and lower Perron solutions agree. So we, we knew that we have one Perron solution there and one there. I forgot to mention that. But whether they agree, that was open for, for quite some time. Um, and Al Bernstein actually asked this question to you, Ahinon, and who said that, well, what what is in their book was what was known as the state of the art at that time, and it did not answer that question. So, and then, so concerning yeah. this Perron solution and solo solutions, Littmann, Stampa, Kerber, and Berger for elliptic equations, I think they also brought the solo uh, solution and Perron. I believe they have proved that. So, because in the first time I came up to you in 1963, they, they looked to, uh, I mean, uniform okay. thing with bounded measurable coefficients, which includes Laplace. Mm -hmm. They dropped exactly in solid solutions, but ended up also uh, in wrong solution. I think the, the uh, result applies at the same Okay, that could be. I mean, I've never definitely seen results in that direction where you have a solar function which is also continuous. Um, but it, it, I, but I mean, that, that is, for instance, in the book by Heinon and Kirkleinen and Mark, you, they have a Sobler function, which is also continuous on the boundary. Then the two solutions agree and they use this as a tool to, to prove things. I think this, this book is actually followed Lisbon, Stampak, Weinberger, and because after that also was a weighted case, was a paper by Jensen and you know, papers. And then the book is kind of was built on that. This yeah. Stampa, Kerber, and Berger, that was yeah. exactly solo solutions and Perron solutions and continued also solo solutions. So Wiener criteria. Yeah. Well, they basically show that Wiener criteria is the same. Yeah. The elliptic case. Yeah. Okay, I'll look back at that, that paper from 63 and see if I can find it in there. Good, okay. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, please. Uh, just a small question. Uh, so you mentioned that as a gap in the theory, this Wiener criterion for metric spaces, what's the obstacle there of extending it to metric spaces? Uh, I mean, it's constructing the... So, so you have one, the sufficiency part, that if, if you have it equal to infinity, then you have a regular point. But in the other one, you have to somehow construct your example showing that it's irregular. <clears throat> and uh, what one are using to do that are Wolf potentials. And they are based on the vector structure. So without the vector structure and the equation, we're kind of without that tool. And that was one of Sort of, it was a long standing problem. Mazia showed the sufficiency of the Wiener criterion for p harmonic functions in 1970. And then it took until 1994 when Kirplein and Amali realized how to, how to construct the, the examples 
what Kip Langen said was that it's basically you you have to find the rest the right test function. But, but exactly. uh, here, so for the, the vector structure, chigra, harmonic functions, combinatorial direction, and for the minimizers without it vector structure, there is the necessity as well, but uh, with the wrong um, power. It's not uh, one over P minus one, but it's one over P, but that's a necessary condition. So there is a gap between the sufficient Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. So let's thank the speaker again.